Okay, hello everybody. Welcome back uh, for another session of um, the West Talk series. Um, just a small intro to uh, the two organizations which are helping us host this. Uh, one is IC Impacts. Uh, you already know uh, us by now, which is um, IC Impacts is a pan Canadian, Canada India research uh, center for excellence. Uh, and it serves as a new model for international collaboration, mainly between India and Canada. Uh, in order to co-develop research solutions to solve uh, global challenges. So we work in both um, industries such as like water or even research in um, construction and infrastructure management. Uh, and it's mainly hosted at UBC and was established in 2013. And we also have the UBC Future Waters Group, which was recently created. Um, and it's, it's basically a UBC research excellence cluster uh, to study the future states of water. So it's, it's, a, it's a combination of different water faculties across the university that have come together. Uh, and the main focus is on interdisciplinary research at the intersection of law, policy, governance, and applied and biophysical sciences. The current West Talks organizing committee uh, has the five of us. Uh, there is myself. Um, I'm, as I already mentioned, I'm a fourth year PhD student. Uh, we also have Jaskaran, uh, who is a current postdoc fellow at McGill University and also a past chair of the IC Impact Student Engagement Committee. Uh, we have Fuhar Dixit, who is the current um, co chair of IC Impact's uh, Student Engagement Committee. Uh, and also Carl Zimmerman, uh, who is currently part of the UBC Future Water Student Group, as well as uh, the current chair of the West Conference. And finally, we have Feria, who basically has been sending you all emails, uh, and she is the IC Impacts event coordinator, has been basically helping host the event throughout. Uh, we actually started in the end of June, and we have had a list of great speakers. Um, as you can see, we also have um, a lot of speakers lined up all the way till December, so make sure you tune in. Um, every Thursday at 9 a.m. And today we have Dr. Boya Zhang. I hope I'm pronouncing the last name correctly. Um, and she is currently in uh, University of Minnesota, but uh, she just finished her postdoc uh, fellowship at MIT. And she's going to be talking about peptide enabled material for sustainable waterborne pathogen control. I know what peptides are, I know what waterborne pathogens are, but I'm interested to see how they kind of come together. Uh, just a brief intro for uh, Dr. Boya. Um, she joined the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering at University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities as an assistant professor in August 2020. So quite fresh uh, into the as a professor. Um, Dr. Zhang's research focuses at the interface of polymer science, environmental chemistry, and membrane material science. Um, one to elucidate the fundamental mechanisms of polymer degradation that dictates the environmental fate and shapes, sustainable design and management of uh, future polymeric chemicals and materials such as uh, microplastics and nanoplastics, and also to develop novel in nature-inspired membrane um, material architecture to enable efficient separation and mitigate pathogenic contamination and fouling. Um, Dr. Boya brings broad experience in polymer degradation science, organic fingerprinting analysis, membrane-based brine treatment, bio-based chemical separation, and sustainable drinking water treatment. So quite a strong arsenal, I must say. Um, Zhang also earned a PhD in environmental engineering at Penn State, uh, where she obtained an MS in agriculture and bio biological engineering as well. Uh, she also earned her bachelor's in biotechnology from East China University of Science and Technology when she researched marine biology at Flinders University of South Australia. Prior to her appointment, as I already mentioned, she was working as a postdoc fellow uh, on multiple sustainable materials and water quality related projects um, with Dr. Desiree Plata at, the MI at MIT. And we're really happy to have you as part of the West Talk series today and look forward to your talk. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Abhishek, for this wonderful introduction. You've um, uh, gave a lot of context of my past experience. Uh, thank you. Um, and I, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Boya, and I'm really excited to speak to the IC Impacts of West Talks today. Um, and I think the thank you for the opportunity to learn about um, who is IC Impacts and what do you do. And I think you're really a, a, a critical organization that really address the challenges by bringing and sharing information across uh, developing and developed countries. So I'm really um, excited to talk today. So um, today I'll talk about how we utilized a natural protein peptide uh, to functionalize a sand filter that achieves a really high removal of E. coli, uh, bacterial pathogens, as well as, well as virus pathogens. And um, 
So we, I started this project uh, during my PhD as a side project and, and later on turned into a really interesting project that can potentially provide solutions, sustainable solutions for uh, drinking water treatment. Um, and I'm really excited to speak to this audience today um, is because I think the work scope really lines well with the um, type of work that is uh, is, is re, uh, being conducted or interested at IC impacts, which is the com developing uh, community based solutions for poor water quality and public health um, issues. So uh, I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to communicate with all of you. I invite questions in the end of the talk and I hope you can take something away from this talk. Um, and if anybody is in interested in follow up with this work and really apply it in developing country, I'm really happy to be connected. Um, so, so since Abhishek already gave a really detailed introduction, I'll keep this really short. Um, I just started at, at University of Minnesota. I am uh, two and a half week into my job, new job. So just want to give you a little bit of background. Um, I was trained as a molecular biologist and protein engineer when I was undergrad. Um, so that perhaps that's how I got my, my bio-inspired uh, work uh, from. And then most of the work that I'm talking today was done uh, during my PhD at Penn State. Um, and so after I finished my postdoc at, at MIT, I uh, came to Minnesota um, just about a, a month ago. So my work primarily uh, looking at, really looking at the polymer material sustainability. And one side is we wanted to develop material, polymer materials and sustainable processes for water treatment and other environmental applications. Um, and here, uh, so we've worked extensively on studying the transport and fouling of polymer membranes during water treatment. Um, and here's an example of uh, treating hydraulic fraction wastewater from unconventional oil and gas. Um, in addition to study the existing material, we also want to uh, use uh, functionalization and surface modification approach to uh, embed functional proteins and peptides onto different surfaces and materials to achieve targeted pathogen removal. This, this is what I will talk about today. And in addition to develop processes and materials for water treatment, we also concern about current existing uh, a, a large quantity of polymer materials such as plastic, how, how they're impacting our water systems. Um, here we're looking at fundamental processes that governs uh, environmental degradation of polymers so that we can eventually predict the true lifetime of plastic and hope to inform the sustainable design of future polymer chemicals and materials. So today I'm going to focus on talking about um, protein functionalized descent filter, how we uh, uh, utilize this natural abundant peptide um, that has both antimicrobial and antiviral properties with two very different mechanisms and how we actually be able to make a very low cost and effective device out of it. Um, and I'll end the talk with some outlook in this field and how I, uh, I would argue that uh, a synthetically and rationally designed peptide can address future challenges in water treatment. So I think the motivation of um, address water treatment challenges um, is that still today, um, we still have about one sixth of global death is due to environmental pollution, both including air and water. This is not new to anybody, but we just wanted to reassure that this is still today a challenge given all the technological advance that we have developed. Um, and the uh, death, uh, con uh, due to unsafe drinking water is 20% is of this death uh, that due to environmental pollution, primarily coming from uh, pathogen contamination. Um, and, and this is not, and you might think this is mostly a developing country issue, but this is also a developed country issue as I will speak a little bit more in the next slides. And these are primarily pathogens, waterborne pathogens are um, both bacteria and virus uh, pathogens that can replicate in your gut environment and then get you sick um, from replicating in your gut environment and end up in the human feces and animal waste that end up in the sewage and then end up in your in our environment. Um, this is trying to distinct it from uh, respiratory uh, pathogen such as the coronavirus we that are, are impacting our life right now. Um, but there is an exemption that is Legionella that is also a respiratory disease pathogen that is likely to reoccur in uh, 
water distribution system in the buildings. Um, and you can, I just want to highlight another point here is that those pathogens are very different in size. We have somewhere almost is less than 30 nanometer size, all the way virus, all the way up to uh, can be as high as a few micron up to 10 micron uh, sizes. And this kind of wide size range that we're trying to control can be a challenge in, in, in treating drinking water. And how are we, so how are we controlling our, those pathogens from water right now? I and mean, this is the, the kind of gold standard uh, modern water treatment plan in a developed country. Um, I won't go into much detail. Um, I hope some students with environmental engineering background have taken this in class, but I just want to highlight here is that we really rely on filtration uh, mechanism to remove those part, uh, those pathogens, we consider them as a particles. And, um, and, and, and so, and, so this filtration is a really important and critical process. And, um, and if a filtration system is not working as we would expect, and this will lead to pathogen outbreaks. And uh, by far the largest outbreak in the US um, are still was speculated to be caused by a filtration system was not able to handle an overload uh, during, a rent, during a storm event. Um, so, so that's one of the aspects, that's one of the part that we still are uh, considering how can we improve the system. Um, and another part I want to just, and then um, as I was uh, mentioning that the pathogen has a pretty wide range of sizes. So for viruses, um, most of the uh, filtration system can actually cannot remove it uh, very well. So we actually also do rely heavily on chemical disinfection such as chlorination to be the last guard um, to remove pathogens. And, but yeah, we, there's only this limited amount of disinfection we can really do um, uh, to, uh, during this process because we have to consider other contaminants um, in the system, which I'll talk a little bit in the next slides. And, um, and after the water is leaving the water treatment plant that is just distributed to each homes, we can also have some, uh, in, and at the end, of your distribution system can also potentially have pathogen recurring issues such as Legionella. So with those challenges um, and how we're treating the water uh, currently and with those potential challenges, I want to propose some opportunities to improve our filters so that we can prevent the next outbreak. And the first one is that can we further enhance the filtration, filtration efficiency at even high turbidity or high load. And the second one is that um, Although we really rely on disinfection to kill the pathogens, uh, especially viruses, but there's a really limited amount of disinfection we can use because there are also toxic disinfection byproducts um, that is going to form if we overdose with chemical disinfection, which I think one of the speakers lined up in the next uh, West Talks will talk about disinfection byproduct issues. And then lastly, I mentioned that um, in addition to centralized treatment facility, those pathogen issues can also still occur uh, in, uh, at a household level. So a point of use device can be really critical to control those reoccurring pathogens. And I also wanna mention this is very critical for uh, communities that are lack of a centralized treatment facility. So how can we make a better filter, um, better scent filter? So we turn back to the classic clean filtration, clean bad filtration model. Um, here I have, um, so this is the clean bad filtration model. Um, I don't wanna go to too much detail, but uh, essentially the removal of the pathogen. So this is the uh, pathogen come out of your filter divided by what goes into your filter will be equal to um, is a function of the porosity length and, and also the size of the sand. And this collector efficiency uh, describes the probability of your particles going to hit the surface via those three transport, transport mechanism. And on top of that, um, we also have the sticking coefficient right here that is directly linear to your log removal efficiency and that talks about the surface interaction between the pathogen and your sand. So once the, sand is, once the pathogen is hitting the sand surface, if it's stick, uh, 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 if it's stick then the sticking coefficient is equal to one, uh, theoretically the maximum number of the sticking coefficient, then it's going to be removed. Um, if the sticking coefficient is low, like close to zero, then um, the particle, even if the particle is hitting the sand surface, it would not be removed. So you can 
uh, mathematically you can see that um, improving the st staking coefficient from zero to one is going to give you an order magnitude increase in your, in your removal of your filter. So this is just to visualize um, what I just described, the relationship. Here I have the log removal plotted with the particle size, and you can see with a staking coefficient as high as one, you can get a much higher removal of your pathogens. So with this theory of, of model basis understanding, so we come up with our design goal of making a better filter is can we make the filter with enhanced surface absorption, such as electrostatic interaction or molecular binding. And then if we be more ambitious about our design goal is can we um, remove the pathogen during bifiltration, but also disinfect it by killing the pathogen so we can save the need for disinfection. With those design goals in mind, we turn to nature for inspiration. Um, so host defense peptides are a class of really short but functional peptides are present in all organisms, all the way from bacteria all the way to a uh, human. So this is a, one of the most, most ancient mechanism that um, uh, uh, already hosts are uh, defending themselves from getting infected by pathogens. And you can see they're varied tremendously by a secondary structure and by size. And Primarily, all of them are, sh uh, although they're very different by size, they primarily have a share a, st a similar structural feature. The first is that most of them are cationically charged. Um, if you, here are some examples of um, some of the peptides from human source. Um, and the, uh, the, and, and the orange um, amino acid are noted as a cationic charge. Um, and the second feature is that they typically have some hydrophobic residuals that give the uh, peptide overall and an epiphilic um, uh, nature. So what happened is that first, because the peptide is possibly charged, and then here is an, an here is an, a bacteria lipid bilayer membrane surface, and then most uh, bacteria lipid uh, bilayer has an anionic lipid head. So by positive charged peptide can first attract and bind with the negatively charged lipid bilayer of a bacteria. And then the amphiphilic nature of the uh, peptide can interact with the hydrophobic tail in the lipid bilayer and then eventually disrupt the membrane. And um, here is just one of the models that potentially can form when you have the peptide interacting with your lipid bilayer. So once the bacteria membrane is broken, then the bacteria will be dead. So this is uh, the killing mechanism. So with this basis, it's both bind and kill, we thought that can we um, potentially make an, an, an ascent filter utilizing this antimicrobial peptides. So the peptides that we choose is come from a, a plant called Moringa lafara. Um, it is widely grown in many tropical regions. I'll talk in the next slides. Um, this is uh, a short 60 amino acid peptide that um, has many positively charged uh, amino acid, and which I noted here as the red dots. And there's also a slight short fraction has two proline uh, residuals that give it a little bit hydrophobic um, in the domain. So give it an amphiphilic uh, property. So we've shown that by grinding those seeds and putting them in the turbid water, we can have coagulation properties because of the charge. Uh, we've also um, incubated this purified protein with E. coli cell, and through this TM image, we can see that there's uh, inner and outer membrane of the E. coli actually was fused and broken. Um, so this is the, uh, an, an evidence of that the protein has an amphiphilic nature, and we also uh, prove those uh, processes with molecular simulation. And then the, one of the reasons we chose this peptide from Moringa is because um, it is really widely grown in, in all over the globe, and uh, which is noted as the green area over here. Um, uh, the, 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 the star uh, showing over here are the places where um, the most originally uh, have grown uh, uh, Moringa uh, seeds. Um, so in these, uh, for those who haven't seen a Moringa tree before, um, they grow those pots on the tree um, and then each tree and then in this pot they have those seeds and each tree can produce about almost 500 kilo seeds uh, per year for one tree. And I just wanted to mention those numbers here um, and to give you the context of, uh, in the end, I'll show you how much protein we need and you can see how much of the drinking water treatment device we can make out of one tree. 
So uh, one of the challenge of utilizing the seed um, uh, is that there's also a lot of oil uh, end up in the seed. So if you directly put the seed into water and then it, they can coagulate, but they also leave a lot of organic matter residuals. So there's another reason we want to functionalize this protein specific onto a stem filter. And then the process of making the stem filter is really simple. Um, we first crush the seeds and, and, and add them into water. Because those peptides are very water soluble and very charged, so they directly uh, dissolve in water in only five to 10 minutes. And then we add the sand particle because the sand particle, most of the sand particles are negatively charged. And just by charge uh, attraction, electrostatic attraction, uh, we can actually coat the uh, very, very stable layer of protein onto the sand surface. And then we pack them into a column and we can test the uh, removal efficiency with both particles and E. coli and viruses. And then this way also we can remove the organic residual that originally could be end up in your water. So next I'm going to show you um, uh, the, some results that we uh, removed uh, E. coli. And here um, I have the log removal. Um, just to note that um, uh, again, uh, uh, an eight log removal equals to 99.99. There's eight nine here percent of a removal versus less than 1% is um, less than 90% removal. So you can see that compared to when we functionalize those protein onto our, uh, a sand, which we call F sand, as compared to the bare sand, we can see the E. coli removal uh, goes up to eight log. Um, we've inputted 10 to times eight. Uh, number of E. coli per mil, and we still end up with no E. coli uh, in, in, the, in, in the affluent water. So we're really excited about um, this result. Just by simply putting the protein uh, onto the sand filter, we were able to achieve really high removal of E. coli. And um, to prove that this is uh, first uh, through a charge uh, mechanism, as I uh, demonstrated before, we also measured the surface charge of the sands as a function of seed concentration. And you can see that when we're increasing the seed coated onto a sand surface, we have, we're turning the sand from a negative charge surface into a positive charge surface that's very sticky. And if we use the DLVO theory to calculate the um, interaction energy, and then we can find that um, the charge, um, uh, we can actually back calculate the sticking coefficient on the sand surface uh, with a bare sand, because it's a, uh, a naturally charged surface, we have um, a very low sticking coefficient. Um, if you recall, the, the, the sticking coefficient has a range from zero to one. As compared to if we coat the surface that turns into an, a positive charge, what we end up with um, is a sticking coefficient of 0.83, which is getting very close to one. So making a very sticky uh, sand filter. That and we think that this is one of the reasons that we have we are observing very high removal of bacteria. We also looked at um, what happened to the bacteria after it's attached to the surface after filtration, and you can see um, here is a live and dead a bacteria stand. The top one is the bare sand, and then this boundary is the sand surface. You can see that um, there's still a lot of live bacteria attached to the bare sand surface as compared to the F sand surface. We see uh, most of the bacteria are dead. So this is another evidence showing that the um, surfaces can attach bacteria, but also kill bacteria. So, and I also want to just quickly show um, uh, uh, the, the real application of this uh, process, this device that we developed. Um, I won't go into much detail, but we did a, a, a longevity a calculation based on some experimental data, and we considered two different size of the filter, um, one is a small household level and one is community uh, a bigger size level um, that can supply a thousand people. Um, if we only consider uh, the capacity of those filters, we actually calculated a really long time that those filters can last over a hundred years. So we're really happy about the capacity. Um, and, and if we assume that we have to replace um, and, and I wanted to say that this is based upon, we haven't tested um, uh, with a realistic water a system that might have other constituents. So if we assume that we place every three months, we still calculate that one tree can supply about 10,000 people per year. These are very encouraging numbers. And I also want to argue um, that if we need a replacement, and we have also developed a very simple and quick regeneration process that can re we can remove the peptides um, coating and then recharge the peptide. 
And the last, I just want to show that we uh, traveled down to Florida uh, on a, a, a farm that grow moringa trees and utilized uh, PVC pipes and local sand and then the moringa tree, moringa tree over there. Um, and we were able to clear um, the pond water as compared to the bare sand very well. And we achieved a, a complete removal of the color form. So this demonstrates a lot of promise of using, really ap applying this technology in developing countries. And I'm really happy to connect with anybody who's really interested in following up this. So I've been speaking about bacteria and, and next I wanna switch gear a little bit and talk about viruses. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it is um, a, a, a bigger challenge to remove because of the size. And here I'll give you some examples of a norovirus, which is an enteric virus that is commonly to human. Um, and MS2 is another virus that is commonly used um, as a model system because the structure, they're very assembled with each other. Um, and then there's also enveloped, and these are what's called unenveloped virus. And then, and then there's, an, in comparison, the SARS-CoV-2, which is impacting our life right now, is an enveloped virus, which is also uh, possible present um, in, in drinking water. So for the unenveloped virus, um, compared different from bacteria, what they have is those capsid protein that is covering the uh, uh, RNA or DNA, the genetic material in the surface. And that actually sometimes gives uh, a surface potential also an active 40. And for the uh, envelope to virus, what we have is called the spike protein that sits on a lipid bilayer, uh, which is they call the envelope. And then in the envelope, they ha you have the genetic material. So our hypothesis is that um, because the surface charge for those, for those virus are also negative. So we wonder if the electrostatic attraction can also help remove uh, virus using our F sand. So we did the same task by loading a very high concentration of MS2 into our F sand filter. And we saw a really exciting um, high removal by our, our F sand filter as compared to best bare sand filter. And then I just want to point out that um, from EPA standard, we have um, very, what was required by the uh, US EPA standard is that we need to achieve four log removal for both filtration and disinfection. And I also just want to mention, so you can compare our filter with uh, a combination of filtration disinfection. We can see that our filter can achieve a higher performance um, of a process that you need both filtration and disinfection. And I also want to say that um, this uh, process is such a simple, uh, with a simple protein coating, we were able to achieve the efficiency that's as high as a lot more sophisticated, dense, or nanoporous membrane structures, and, and even the chemical disinfectants. Next, I wanted to uh, tell you a really interesting story. Um, we we're very encouraged with this result, but we actually found some really um, interesting and new finding that we would not expect in terms of um, the, the peptide interacting with the virus and how this virus is actually removed by this protein. So first, what we see is that we actually see a difference in log removal when we are loading different types of seeds. Um, and we were very intrigued by this result um, for a while. We didn't understand why. And then later on, we did a more uh, detailed analysis of this peptide that is absorbed on the surface. And what we found was that um, this is the Moringa uh, uh, coagulation protein that I have been talking about that has antimicrobial properties. We also found another type of protein that is present in the Moringa seeds, um, uh, which uh, has very, uh, share a lot of amino acid, share a very similar sequence with the coagulation protein, uh, but also has this chitin binding domain, which I uh, show as a purple here. Uh, so I'm going to call this uh, protein as a Moringa chitin binding protein. Long story short, I'm going to tell you a more story later on, but long story short is that we found this chitin binding protein is what is responsible to remove MS2 virus as compared to the Moringa coagulation protein. And then we hypothesize, um, uh, and then so we, we dive in a little bit further to look at what is really um, the, the mechanism on why does this protein can remove virus, but this cannot. And we hypothesized the difference between those two seeds is because uh, one of the seeds has a lot more chitin binding protein as compared to uh, the other seed. So we first looked at um, 
uh, utilizing the molecular docking simulations to look at what is the binding domain, what is the binding energy for those two different proteins that were looked at. Um, so our collaborator, uh, Ratu Chalahari, um, who was a graduate student at the same time with me and now is a postdoc at Harvard Medical School, who specialized in protein, uh, computational protein design, including machine learning algorithms and optimization algorithms. So he ran uh, a docking experiment where you create 3D structures of those two proteins, and then you can find um, the closed binding pockets that were two amino acids from those two proteins are so close to each other are creating molecular level binding interactions. So, and then by calculating the summation of those interaction, you can find that um, the MS2 protein, which is the a cayenne color in the bottom, um, has uh, a very negative uh, a, a binding free energy with the our chitin binding protein, which indicates a favorable, thermodynamically is a favorable binding. Um, and as compared to the coagulation protein I've been talking about, which is the yellow color here, and actually has an unfavorable binding energy, which is a positive binding energy. So, so from this molecular docking simulation is the uh, we told is the first time the first uh, evidence that told us that the uh, the chitin binding protein is was responsible for removing MS2. And from those simulation, we can also look closer at the molecular level details. We found mostly our electrostatic interactions, and we even have some really strong hydrogen bonding going on. That's what caused this high removal. And we also found that uh, the chitin binding domain, uh, which is the flexible loop on the on the side, is is uh, what's binding with the MS2. So. This is just a molecular simulation uh, computational results. We calculated this process. We also wanted to see, use experimental data to prove that this is really the binding mechanism. So we really understand how um, our filter is removing MS2 virus. So let's take a closer look at the chitin binding protein domain uh, on the uh, chitin binding protein. And this is a protein that, just like is the name, is a chitin binding protein. So, um, we took the monomer of chitin. Um, chitin is a polysaccharide that um, has repeated units of N-acetylglucosamine. So um, we think that, so we ran this uh, monomer with our chitin binding protein again, and we see exactly it binds at the binding chitin domain and also at a very negative energy, which is suggesting this is a very strong binding. So even stronger than binding with MS2. So with this result, um, we come up with a hypothesis is that if we add chitin monomer first onto our scent filter, um, if just like what's uh, done in the simulation, it really binds with the chitin binding domain that are so strong that it's going to block the site, then when we add MS2 into the scent filter, the MS2 cannot be removed, then we end up in a low removal. So Charing in my group that um, took over the project after I graduated and they did this experiment and found exactly what we we're expecting. So when, when you add the chitin monomer, we found much lower removal. Before you add MS2, we found much lower removal of, of MS2 as compared to the original when we don't add the, the chitin monomer. So with this experiment, we're really, com we're really confident that um, the chitin binding domain uh, on the MOCBP is what is responsible for binding MS2, and that's why the coagulation protein that can kill bacteria actually cannot remove this virus. And this is really the first time, this was just probably published last year, and this was the first time that the Moringa chitin binding protein, uh, we show that those protein can also remove virus from binding a mechanism. And looking forward, uh, we're so encouraged and excited about this result. We also uh, found that we also did a simulation and looked at uh, those protein interacting with other uh, capsid protein uh, of rotavirus and norovirus. And we also found very uh, negative free binding energy suggesting the strong binding of those protein with other uh, viruses as well. And if you look closer, what's really interesting is that those flexible loop over here that was binding with MS2 is not the binding domain anymore. So this tells us that there's actually different domain of this peptide can potentially bind with different virus at the same time. So we're really excited to keep exploring this field. 
And then we also did simulation with um, SARS-CoV-2 that is uh, really relevant right now with um, considering the global pandemic. And we also found uh, a very comparable binding and energy. This is a published, unpublished result. Um, very comparable binding energy uh, with the spike protein on the coronavirus right at the uh, domain where uh, the virus is, intera is, is, is uh, infecting human cell. So very, we're very excited, um, encouraged with the simulation result and we'll, we're currently working on developing filters and also sensor device out of uh, with our Moringa protein. I hope by far you are um, also as excited as I am and, and um, think that this uh, peptide coated scent filter is a potentially a low cost um, and, and yet very efficient filter to remove um, waterborne pathogens in different settings. And looking forward, um, there's a few more challenges we are hoping to address. And the first one is that pathogens um, are evolving. And um, considering our, um, there's a lot of antibiotics present in different water systems, and we um, think that there might be uh, uh, some evolving pathogens that can potentially be um, uh, one of the challenges that we need to um, address uh, is the pathogens that are evolving to be more resistant to our antimicrobial strategies. And the second is that uh, when we, whenever we apply those systems to environmental applications, we have to think about um, whether those coatings are stable under different environmental conditions. Especially protein can be uh, degraded by proteinase uh, that are ubiquitous in different water systems. So this is when I wanted to uh, turn into a rationally designed synthetic peptide to address these two challenges. And the good news is that the peptides um, are very tunable as compared to other different material. They are uh, sequenced and every, you can change every amino acid to, that can drastically uh, actually change the secondary structures or all the properties. So, and here is a uh, rough a plan of how we're going to uh, address uh, uh, start this part of the work is that we can uh, think about either um, from a de novo design, so we have a peptide that's designed from complete scratch, or we can use a template um, that is, we know uh, the Moringa protein works and we can build new peptides out of the Moringa protein. Um, and then we can generate a range of sequences that um, can be uh, tested with experimental results. Um, and where we're also hoping to build a predictive function that can uh, uh, correlate the properties in the peptide with um, their potency in terms of antimicrobial potency or antiviral potencies. And this is a very uh, long-term objective that we are trying to uh, look at, um, but uh, there are some more recent study have looked at building such linear correlation between the antimicrobial potency with the amount of charge that's on, on peptide, uh, how much hydrophobicity amino acid is there, and then the length of the peptide. And then hopefully this process is iterative and then we ultimately are resulting in an optimized peptide that can be uh, specifically um, optimized to certain applications. So with that, I would like to conclude. Um, and I've demonstrated a low cost and a simple device that can achieve um, very high removal of E. coli and viruses. And those removal mechanism uh, for bacteria and virus are actually very distinct. Uh, one, it's from, uh, through uh, electrostatic attraction and then membrane uh, lipid bilayer disruption. And then for virus removal, we actually found the, the specific protein protein binding is what dominating the removal. And lastly, I'd like to say this is just a start. We're only looking at one plant and two protein. I'd like to say there's a lot more um, plant derived uh, peptides out there that we can explore and, and explore their function for environmental applications. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I look forward to hear your questions.